It's a rainy September morning, somewhere in ancient Germania. A young, sturdy man tries to adjust his chainmail, watching the unsuspecting Roman column marching in the distance. The sight of robust imperial soldiers in well-fitting, identical sets of armor made the young warrior bitterly envious. Then, he gets a hearty clap on the back from his elder comrade as their war chief signals for them to take positions. Many hundreds of tribal warriors rush to man their posts. A decisive clash that would set the future of the entire region is about to begin. It is the year 4 AD, the very beginning of the first millennium. Roman Emperor Augustus charges his stepson Tiberius with the mission of commanding the Rhine legions and supervising the integration of the vast untamed wilds to the east, known to the Romans as Germania. The local tribes were notorious for their unpredictable nature, so their Romanization was a long, arduous process requiring a considerable amount of resources and manpower. Tiberius followed the tried-and-true Roman method of conquest, just like his brother Drusus 15 years earlier. A number of campaigns into Germania were launched to intimidate those still resisting Romanization, and by the year 6 AD, most of the Germanic tribes living between the Lower Rhine and Elbe rivers were pacified, at least from the Roman point of view. Since Germania was believed to be more or less tamed, Augustus was enabled to send much of the legionary fighting force of the Rhine frontier southeast to the province of Illyricum to squash the rebellion kindling there. To continue Tiberius' work in Germania, the emperor chose an experienced civil administrator, Publius Quintilius Varus, whose task was to introduce Roman jurisdiction to the region, expand its infrastructure, and continue the long process of integrating new territories into the empire. Varus took up the mission to transfer Germania into the Roman province, much like Gaul had been transformed 50 years earlier. Hence, Roman civic order was imposed across the land, along with the Roman tax system, in line with the expectations of Augustus. From the emperor's viewpoint, Varus did precisely what he was intended to. But for the Germanic people, his methods were crude and hastily introduced, which resulted in a wave of discontent among the tribesmen. Besides, throughout history, tax collectors never have much been cherished guests. Varus's heavy-handed approach and strong belief of the superiority of the Roman culture didn't garner him much love among his Germanic subjects. But thanks to the native advisors who helped the Roman governor to gauge the mood of the clansmen, he was aware he would not win any popularity contest in Germania and tried to act with caution. By the year 9 AD, Varus appeared to be well accustomed to his governing position, laying foundations for the undeveloped road network, enlarging legionary camps, and maintaining relative stability east of the Rhine. By the very end of summer, Varus was inspecting Roman fortifications on the Visa River and slowly prepared to march his legions back in the wake of winter. On his journey west, however, Varus was approached by Arminius, one of his chief Germanic advisors, bringing up the latest reports. He claimed that one of the local tribes rose up in a rebellion just a couple of days' march away. Varus followed the Roman playbook of taking action at the first sign of trouble and commanded his army to divert from a well-known path, ready to challenge the insurgents. Germanic riders who served as scouts were sent ahead while the bulk of the legionary force pushed through the countryside. Varus had many reasons to depend on the native guides, and among them, Arminius seemed one of the most reliable. Born as a son of a Karuski war chief, he was brought to Rome as a child and received Roman education and training, eventually reaching the high ranks of the auxiliary cavalry. Basically, a prime example of what Romanization would look like. So when Arminius left the column with another group of riders, Varus didn't sense anything out of order. In the meantime, the legionary column snaked through the dense forest soaked by the soft rain that got heavier with every passing hour. Trudging forward along a sloppy path, the Romans let their guard down, ignoring discipline and tactical integrity. The legionaries cursed the elements as they waded through the muddy ground. Varus believed he had a solid grasp of the surroundings, but the near future didn't look too optimistic. He raised his head up 
hearing a number of rasping screams echoed on both sides of the path. It was the only warning before a rain of javelins, spears and rocks were thrown upon the unsuspecting Roman soldiers. Slow to react at first, the legionaries rallied around battle-hardened centurions, struggling to regain discipline, while the barbarians rushed to engage the unprepared enemy. A furious melee ensued. Germanic warriors smashed the Roman column to make the most of this surprise attack. But even in such favorable conditions, the tribesmen lacked sufficient punch to break the Roman imperial legions in the apex of their might. As soon as the latter regained a measure of cohesion, the barbarians vanished back into the woods. Baggage carts were overturned, wounded men and animals cried in agony. Yet it was no time for despair. Varus and his officers quickly recovered the Roman army upon pushing through to the nearest suitable place to raise a marching camp for the night. Varus must surely have been angered over the betrayal of Arminius, who hailed from the Karuski tribe, once declared by Tiberius as friends of the Roman people. Legionary officers shared many bitter words over the faithless Karuski, but Varus was busy weighing his choices. At last, he decided to break camp in the morning and push west as fast as possible. The safe bank of the Rhine River was still five days of forced march away, but having suddenly found themselves in the middle of enemy territory with no scouts or preparation, it was basically a do-or-die scenario for the Romans. With this in mind, Varus led his men through the largely uncharted Germanian countryside. Aside from occasional minor attacks of the barbarians, the plan looked promising even though the seemingly perpetual rain drenched all the legionary equipment. Despite setbacks, the Romans marched for the entire day and through the night, determined to reach the Rhine and escape this forsaken land. In the morning, the battered legions entered into a narrow pass, limited by a high hill to the south and a large, impassable bog to the north. Visibly depleted by the night-long march, the Romans probably didn't fully understand how perilous the area was that they crossed by. Then, Varus noticed the makeshift wall of earth and branches running along the base of the hill. He immediately knew what that meant, but it was too late to turn back. Hundreds of Germanic warriors rose behind the wall and engaged the enemy from a distance, hurling a variety of missiles at the Romans, who this time were better prepared for an ambush. Their standardized armor and large shields provided some modest protection, deflecting many of the projectiles. Arminius wrestled to hold the spirited warriors behind the wall and continued to harass the enemy from a distance. Throughout his time among the Romans, he learned too well that his lightly armored kinsmen were no match against the disciplined Roman heavy infantry, especially in hand-to-hand -hand combat. While Arminius struggled to keep his warriors at bay and follow the battle plan, some Roman cohorts, unwilling to remain sitting ducks, advanced up the hill at the Germanic Wall. In a display of superior training and resolve, the Roman infantry put down many barbarian warriors, scoring some immediate and temporary victories. Yet being at a severe tactical disadvantage, their attack was eventually repulsed. As time marched on, the Roman formations, suffering from the constant range attacks of the natives, began to lose cohesion. More and more warriors, hailing from many tribes, poured into the area to take part in the battle. At last, Arminius decided it was the best moment to strike, and with a gesture of his hand, unleashed the waves of Germanic warriors at the disarrayed Roman legions. Thousands of natives, armed with spears, axes and swords, clashed with the enemy ranks, overwhelming the Romans with sheer numbers. Everything seemed against them, yet the Roman soldiers stood their ground, but with every enemy unit joining the fray, they slowly realized that the soggy base of the hill in the middle of Germanic nowhere was to be their last stand. Unwilling to witness the imminent doom of his army, Varus, along with many top officers, committed suicide. The fighting lasted until evening, with only dozens able to escape. The destruction of three Roman legions caused major shock across the empire. Twenty years of Roman efforts in Germania lay in ruins as the natives destroyed isolated camps and trading outposts. The defeat in Teutoburg Forest was effectively the end of Roman hopes to conquer the lands east of the Rhine. Upon hearing the catastrophic news, an elderly Augustus was filled with grief and refused to shave or cut his hair for months. Until his final moment, he would often lament with great sorrow, Quintilius Varus, Give me back my legions.